they have hired a new head coach at Texas A&M, and it's Mike Elko, head coach at Duke, formerly of Texas A&M. 24 hours ago, though, it was Mark Stoops. Stoops was signed. Actually, he wasn't. He was just kind of, kind of delivered, and the signed and sealed was in the process of happening. And then Texas A&M flexed a little bit. Not the administration, the fan base. And they got that thing overturned. The I Josh was burning up last night. I had a lot of people in that part of the country telling me how much disdain they had once they started learning that Mark Stoops was going to be the head coach of Texas A&M. And I told them, well, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. Like, I think Stoops is a good coach. I think he'd do fine there. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not my business. It's your business. Well, then everybody felt that way. And it was, it was, according to you guys, it was not nearly to the degree of animus that ten, Tennessee fans uh, displayed when they thought they were going to hire Greg Schiano. But it felt the same to me because in the span of a few hours, it went from Mark Stoops is going to be the head coach at A&M to Stoops is staying at Kentucky. You guys got that overturned, just like Tennessee fans did back in the day. Now, they went on to hire Jeremy Pruitt and it torpedoed their program. You went on to hire Mike Elko a day later, and the results are to be determined here. I think Mike Elko is going to be okay, though. I like Elko as a hire more than Mark Stoops, and I would have been fine with Mark Stoops. Um, you haven't had a high-level CEO running Texas A&M football in quite a while. And if I don't know anything else about Elko, I know you got one in him. And you may think to yourself, well, how can you say that about Jimbo Fisher? I mean, isn't the head coach, the CEO of the program, well, he's supposed to be. It just, it was never a comfort zone. It was never the way that anyone around Jimbo Fisher would describe him. In fact, they would describe, they would actually quite the opposite. They'd describe him as unorganized. Uh, they would describe him as a guy who needed a CEO type around him because he wasn't that. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses. This is not bang on Jimbo Fisher night. I'm just saying, if you want to, if you want to correct course and you want to fill in the blanks that were not filled in previously, that's how you do it. You go find a guy who, who knows your program because he was there, and therefore he knows some of the I's that need to be dotted and T's that need to be crossed. But also, if you didn't have a CEO type and there was just there were some loose ends here and there that end up being the difference in one possession games on fields on Saturdays, Go get a guy who does fit that description. And Mike Elko does. And you know what else? He's a really good football coach. And I would challenge you to find anyone who suggests otherwise. Uh, I've had some points of contention on this. Not many. Now, I'll grant you, most A&M fans seem to like this hire. I've actually had more people from the outside uh, talk about how they don't think it's flashy enough. And to that, I just say, that's not a serious football-related point. I could. I just don't care. Uh, flash wins nothing. I'll give you an example. You know who made a flashy, splashy hire recently? USC did. USC is sitting at home nowhere close to the Pac-12 championship game this weekend. Now, that may change in the future, but USC won the press conference. You, they got a ton of coverage on this show. You go and take Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma, and he's your head coach. Man, that's, that's the old Grand Slam. That's the fabled Grand Slam hire I'm about to talk about in a second. Well, what did it get you? So had USC hired Mike Elko, oh, it would have been slammed. This isn't, this isn't Southern California. This isn't Los Angeles. You got you to gotta make a splash. You got to resonate. No, you got to win. That's what you have to do. Winning cures everything. Well, you got to have a fit, don't you, Josh? Yeah. The right way to fit at Texas A&M or USC or anywhere else, is win. Don't care if you've ever worn cowboy boots before. Don't care what your accent is. I care that you understand how to build and sustain an organization. I care that you understand how to acquire and develop talent. I want to know that you understand how to run a major program and deal with a lot of the off the fields that come with that. I want to know that you're structured. I want to know that you get how to promote and market properly and not just say, oh, let's do some social media stuff. And I want to know that you can hire a high-level staff and have a singular vision. That's what fit is at Texas A&M or anywhere else. Second thing that I've been asked sarcastically by a lot of people. I've been asked by a lot of people, well, now that they hired Elko and it was him after Stoops blew up, those aren't A-list tier one kind of names. 
you must have been wrong in your assertion that this is a tier one job. Well, hey, I could be wrong about it. But if you're asking me if I think this proves my opinion wrong, uh, blank, no, it doesn't. Look at me self-censoring. No, it doesn't. No, I think everything I thought about the value of the A&M job. It's just I think you're chasing a unicorn when you imagine what a tier one job being open is actually like. I think Georgia's one. I think Ohio State's one. I think Oklahoma's one. I, I do think A&M is one. I mentioned those programs because let me ask you something. They've all hired coaches semi-recently. Where were the Grand Slam hires? The Grand Slam doesn't happen. The Grand Slam hire doesn't happen. In other words, the move that you think a tier one program should be able to go out there and make happen actually doesn't happen. In other words, I had folks thinking, well, unless they go pry Ryan Day away or, or Dabo Swinney, that's proof that this really isn't the job that Josh made it out to be. No, nobody does that. No job, when it comes open, does that. You start, you start calling BS on me here. I'm going to ask you, list the Grand Slam hires. And by Grand Slam, I mean a program that went and got an already established championship caliber coach to come to their program. List them. You got Bama a decade and a half ago. They got Nick Saban. Keep listing them. Keep going. Don't, don't give me Kirby Smart. Dude had never been a head coach a day in his life when Georgia hired him. Don't give me Lincoln at Oklahoma. Ditto. Don't give me Lincoln at USC because he hadn't done anything there. Dan Lanning, never been a head coach when Oregon went and hired him. They're all taking chances. These aren't Grand Slam hires. What about Dabo? What about Dabo? Dabo had never even been a coordinator at Clemson before they elevated him. Keep going. Steve Sarkeesian could be in the playoff. Sark had been a head coach that failed multiple times and had to beg for a job as an off-field guy at Alabama to even get back in, in, in any kind of standing that would get him a job down the road. Where are the Grand Slam hires? These are high-level programs I'm listing. Oklahoma just had one. They went and hired Brent Venables. Brent Venables isn't a Grand Slam hire. Your hope is that they end up being Grand Slam coaches. My point is, I remember when these guys were hired. I remember all the list of the dream candidates, and they didn't come true because the Grand Slam hire doesn't happen as you define it. What you have to do is you have to have your critical traits and factors clearly listed. You have to have a very keen eye in understanding what makes a quality head coach and what separates that from, you know, what just makes a good coordinator. And, and you got to have really good structure. You could argue they haven't had those things in the past at Texas A&M, but I will stand by every word I said. The things that it takes to win, A&M doesn't lack any of them. They may have once upon a time. They don't now. It's just there is no such thing. Outside of LSU getting Brian Kelly, I will grant you that that's a Grand Slam hire if you define Grand Slam by getting a guy who has a championship caliber past. He didn't win a title at Notre Dame, but he had them at a consistently high level. I will grant you, if you want to tell me Michigan landing Jim Harbaugh was a Grand Slam, I will grant you that they went to the NFL to get him. And he's a Michigan guy, so there was kind of a unique inroad there. Outside of that, where are they? It's Nick Saban. That's who it is. Alabama pulled it off, and then everyone started to think, oh, that's what we'll do if our tier one job comes open. That's not the way it works. It's not, I know you think you dunked on me with that one. This is not the flex you think it is. And so they're hiring Mike Elko, and um, I think he'll do good there. For all I know, he will be a Grand Slam hire. It's just that if he is... You won't know immediately. You won't know. I, I was listening, like, like, for example, I texted Lucci a little while ago. I was listening to Billy Lucci and uh, the folks over at Texax talk about this earlier today. And I kind of thought about that, and I, I, I extrapolated a little bit further. Man, they're right. Like, Ryan Day, a lot of Texas A&M fans thought, we may go after him. You, you weren't going to get Ryan Day. You, like, you weren't going to get Dabo Swinney. And the reason those guys weren't in play is not because you don't have a good job. It's because in college football... Guys don't leave tier ones for other tier ones. Lincoln Riley is the exception to the rule, and he may have made a catastrophic error in judgment. And, and Oklahoma is doing pretty okay without him. Um, so congratulations to Mike Elko. Congratulations to you guys who have a head coach now. I'll be excited to hear that press conference. Excited. I, look, Mike Elko's not a win-the-press-conference guy. I think he'll win the press conference too, though, so I think it'll be, um, I think it'll be all thumbs up out there.